All right. If you didn't know, we're a church plant and we're part of a church planting network. Many of you know that we are, but that's a little showcase of what God is doing around the world through the church planting network, Acts 29, which we are a part of. Some of you have come from Acts 29 churches. Others of you have family members who have planted Acts 29 churches. But uh, what we want to do today, the network uh, collectively, globally, we wanted to have a church planting Sunday, a day where we, we all got together and celebrated what God is doing in and through the network around the world. And so I want to start off our time uh, today with a, a few details about what God is doing, really to just stir your heart and your affections for, for what God is doing in and through Acts 29 and, and through uh, the gospel-centered church planting around the world. And so uh, being in Acts uh, a member of Acts 29 Church, first I want you to understand this is not a denomination. It's a network of church planting churches. It's interdenominational. We, we are uh, a network where we have, we've, we've come together, like-minded, to plant gospel-centered churches all across the world. And so I have a couple things for us, an update um, for us. Uh, Acts 29 this last year, in 2020, the, day the, the, the year the world shut down. In 2020 alone, Acts 29 planted over uh, 25 churches, and that's when you weren't allowed to like start new. This is new works that started from the ground up. No, I mean, no one has a building, no one can meet. 25 churches were planted and birthed and started in a, in a time in which you weren't allowed to even meet and gather across the entire world. So that's a one proof that, you know, it doesn't matter who shuts the world down, God's always at work. And so I want to praise God for that. But also in this last year, we... we 6,500 people met the Lord Jesus and gave their lives to him. And they've been, their eternity secured and they've been saved. That's a good, yes, you can clap for that. Amen. That's awesome. 6,500 people just through this network. That's not to mention other networks in the world that God is at work. God is at work. And I hope you see that we are a part of something that is huge, that is bigger than us. It's bigger than us. And so uh, a couple other things on this. Uh, some of you have even met Jesus through the well. Like you're part of, and even this last year, you're part of those, that number where we're celebrating globally today who've met and know Jesus. Additionally, we've been a part of uh, helping start one of those churches in the, in, in, uh, of the 25 in the world this year. Uh, we, we helped plant a church, and, and they're, still, they're still working in Kuwait City, Kuwait. Many of you remember Blaine Boyd when he was uh, in 2019, 2018, 2019, trying to raise money, trying to, had a vision to plant a church in Kuwait City, Kuwait. A city that has the highest concentration of expat Arabs in the entire world was planted and, 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 and they, they got their visa. It was, a, it was a long story that I don't have time to get into. But we've been a part of, of, of helping support uh, church planting, not just in Kuwait, but also in the entire Middle East. Uh, there's a hub in, of Acts 29 pastors and church planters in uh, Dubai that are sending men and women uh, and church planting teams all over the, uh, the 1040 window. If you don't know what that is, that's a window where it's the most unreached area of the world. Additionally, the, the, the network has, is, is a network that, the reason why we are part of it is, is because of this. It's because it's a network that, that trains, assesses, and equips uh, holistically churches and church planters for the work that God's called them to. Um, I went through an entire assessment. Jessica, my wife, and I went through this entire assessment. Uh, and the, the big goal and purpose of Acts 29 is they want to plant not just churches, but healthy churches. Churches that plant other healthy churches. And one of the ways they found that the best way to do that is through the assessment of the, the, the lead planter. And some of you don't know this, but God is calling you to plant a church. And you don't, you don't know it yet. And maybe God hasn't told you that. But uh, maybe he will today. But, but, but I want you to know this network is, is, the, is geared to assess that, to vet that call, to, to support that call, and to train and, and enlist you in that call. And the reason being is because we believe that God's primary strategy for reaching the world is through his church. The ultimate, uh, the, 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 if you make disciples, if you follow the Great Commission, which says go make disciples. Just like last week we saw that, that God told Abraham to go. We've all been called to go make disciples. The natural overflow of disciple making will ultimately result in, result in church planting. You take one person who meets Jesus they, they've, they, they've, they've come to faith in Jesus. They share their faith with someone and they begin to disciple that. All of a sudden, you have people who, who, who must gather together and organize themselves in what we call the local church, like we're gathered here today, and you've planted a church. You send out others to plant more and plant more. This is the strategy of the New Testament. Where Jesus began. This is the strategy still to this day. We've been planting churches that plant churches that plant churches since Jesus got out of the grave. 
And so I would just want to, to just call to mind what God is doing around the world. And I want you to I hope I've been praying that this would stir your affections and, and actually focus your attention on some good news. And in a year that was really, really dark for, for many and most, uh, it was a year that God's church still remained faithful. God kept establishing and growing his church. People kept meeting Jesus. And this is a good and great and awesome thing. Um, and additionally, I wanted to showcase for you, the family we're a part of. You saw the, the, the nations have been represented. I believe it's, it's somewhere, there's, uh, there's, there's multiple, I, 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 700 church members meeting in 50 different countries, 50 different countries in the world with 30 different languages that are worshiping the Lord Jesus. And while we are not all worshiping the Lord Jesus in, in 30 different languages here today, there will be a day coming in the new heavens and the new earth where we will be gathered with these brothers and sisters. And I think far too often we forget about what God is doing globally and what God is doing even in our city, in our nation. And many of us forget about the family, our family that's, that's worldwide. And so I wanted to, today to, to spur you on to, to see that, to, to rejoice in that. And also, I wanted to provide an avenue for conversations to get stirred up and had in, this, in, our, in our church. And so, if you, you may be sitting on it, but there is a brochure that Acts 29 has provided for us. And in it, tells you a little bit more about the network, but also how, how you can get involved. The first thing is through prayer. The reality is, like, this is, mo- everyone, every Christian in here is going, yeah, that's how you get involved. You pray first. Yeah, but do you do it? I just ask you, like, do you do it? I'm not shaming you. I'm just saying like, yes, this is the most pivotal thing we could do is pray for the churches. I want to do that here in a moment. I want to pray for the churches in our network, in, in our church here. But then also you can partner. You can be a part of it, whether it be financially or, 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 or signing up to plan a church or, you know, seeking uh, assessment. Or just come up to me afterwards and ask any questions you have about the network or how you can be involved in it. But, but we wanted to e- equip you with some resources to at least, one, for some of you, let you know we're part of a church planning network that plants churches. We've been, you know, 2020, there's a lot of things that have happened that we haven't been able to corporately get together and showcase what God is doing. And furthermore, uh, God may be calling you or you may know someone who wants to plant a church. And we want to be a part of assessing and helping and equipping and establishing that. Either way, it, uh, God is at work. The question is, are we going to be a part of it? Are we going to continue to join in what he's doing? And if you have d- decided that you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to make disciples in the context of your everyday life, which is our mission statement here in San Antonio, I want you to know you're part of church planting. The natural result will be more churches planted. I want you to see that. Church planting is not just something that one guy does and he has a big old vision and, and he stands up and talks to everyone. It's, it's what God is doing through individuals like you on the everyday level of disciple making that ultimately birth churches that plant churches that plant churches. So to the degree that we, we are a church that is about our mission statement, about the, making disciples of Jesus in our context of everyday life, if we, we do that, we will continue to be a blessing uh, in a church planting funnel to the nations. And so I want to pray uh, for uh, all the churches in our network um, and thank Jesus for what he's doing. And then we'll jump in to Genesis and uh, keep marching through the life and legacy of Abraham. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you're doing in our church, in our city, and around the world. Lord Jesus, it is you who have planted the, these churches. It is you who are sustaining them. It was your idea. We've just said yes to your call. And so... I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would assist, help overcome the obstacles and challenges that many churches have had this year, that many churches are, going, are entering into in this, in this next year. Lord, that you would protect them spiritually. You would remind them of the mercy and great, your mercy and grace, that, that you, the same gospel that saves us is the same gospel that sustains us and propels us forward. May we be, it, as a network in all of Jesus, your work, and your, your person, who you are. And then lastly, Lord, may we make massive progress in the coming years to see more and more people reached, more and more people saved, and more and more glory given back to you that's due your name. Jesus, we ask also now in this time of preaching that you would, would be glorified and made much of. And Holy Spirit, you would bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen.
Awesome. Well, if you got a Bible, uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter, uh, where are we at today? We're in chapter uh, 12. We're going to be in 13. If you don't own one, uh, uh, you can raise your hand. Or we have these new uh, devotionals. This is part two. You can go ahead and raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring you one. I'll explain. If you don't have a devotional, this is for you. It's a devotional journal. And in it, you'll see that uh, on, on page uh, 26 is where we start today. You'll see the sermon text on the left on page 27. Uh, some pastor notes on the right that I've we put together for you. And additionally, tomorrow you'll see there's a daily devotional uh, that, will, that will guide you through uh, the, the text we're studying, help you further in your study through our time in Genesis. But we are in volume two looking at uh, our second installment of our journey through Genesis. We're looking at Abraham. Abraham. Abraham's a patriarch. Yeah, we, we talked about this last week. A patriarch is a man by whom which a new way of living comes from. Abraham meets the Lord. He gets saved. He, he becomes a, a God-fearing man. He was a pagan. He meets, he meets God. He gets changed. And then he goes immediately on mission. God's first words to him were, go. And he went. And he followed. And he's following uh, where, where God, Yahweh, the, the God of the Bible, is taking him. And so I want to give us a little recap of our entire journey through Genesis. Not, I mean, literally real quick. It started with a, a guy named a, a Adam. That's where we're going back. Don't worry, it won't be long. Uh, it started with a guy named Adam. Adam, he, he was the first man, he and his wife Eve, first ma- male and female. Adam quickly, quickly disobeys God. God tells him to not do something. He goes, yep, that's what I'm going to do. Let's do that. That's the first thing that happened. Adam and Eve fall. They fall to sin and they, get, they had God's blessing on them. They, get, they receive the cr- a curse for the entire mankind and they get kicked out of the garden. And then they, uh, later we see a man named Noah show up. Now fast forward to Noah. God used Adam to start, to, to start the world. God restarts the world with a man named Noah. And, and there's a big old flood that comes that wipes out sin and, and humans and uh, it doesn't change. It doesn't changed the heart of man, but it, it, it changed the landscape, literally the landscape. It's all flooded. And, and we restart with a man named Noah. Well, quickly, Noah falls. Gets drunk, passes out in his bed. His son's wicked and weird. It's a whole story. We have sermons on it. You can go back and listen to it. That's what happens. So Adam, God's man, God's blessed man, fails. Noah, God's man, blessed man, fails. Today, Abraham, we, we get into his failure Right off the bat, all these guys that God calls, he creates, he makes, quickly they get, they ruin everything. It's, this is, I want you to see this, this is the story line throughout the entire Bible, that men and women are broken, messed up, sinful people. We are, all of us. Like it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't take any time at all when we're studying the scriptures to see that the, the people that God calls and uses, like quickly fail. Quickly fail. And so we're going to look at Abram, or Abraham's failure today, his, his falling, so to speak. I want you to see that God grows us in lesson. Through, he, he continues to grow us with, through, through our sin, through our folly. Reason being is because his grace continues to abound. And what we're going to see through, through Adam we saw, Adam and Eve, they sinned. God quickly pursued them, sought them out, covered them, their shame, made clothing for them in their nakedness. Abraham, in the same, or uh, Noah, the same way. God covers his, uses his son to cover his shame. Today, Abraham's going to act like a fool, and God's going to intervene and undo what Abraham was doing. I want you to see this that throughout our time today: that God's mercy and grace continues to abound and abound and abound and abound and abound. It abounds towards you, and I want you to know this: this is really, this is going to be hard for you to understand. It abounds towards other people. Like bad people. People you hate. Like people you don't like. Like people you really, really, really don't like. I mean, we're going to look at Abraham and see some of the things he does today. And that makes me angry. Like, I don't like that. I don't like it. I'm sure some of you don't like that there are certain things that certain people have done. You don't like that God's grace would abound to them. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he killed Christians. I'm sure the church originally was like, man, that dude is now the preacher? He's planting churches? Like he was killing, he killed my friend. Like that's the type that when God has mercy and grace and saves someone, that's the type of stuff that happens. Like you could be the the, the pastor of the church, the Apostle Paul, the church planting dude, had killed Christians. I'm sure along the way people were just like, man, bitter against him, angry against him, 
Maybe even anger, angry and bitter against God. Like, how could you use a man like that? Some of you think that you're really perfect. And you're like, oh, maybe I'm not perfect, but I'm better than other people. <laughs> God's grace abounds to you too. So let's look at Abram's foolish plan. We'll start there. I want us to see that, or I really do want us to see God's faithfulness and God's grace towards us. And I want us to stop taking ourselves so seriously and take God more seriously. So let's look at this. This is our patriarch. This is the man whom God calls to, 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 to lead a nation and a generation of people who will be God-fearing people. Now there was a famine in the land. That's where we start. I want you to see there was a famine in the land. What land? What land? Genesis after 12, verse 10, there was a famine in the land. What land? What just happened? And The land that God called him to. You see this? God has said, Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to prosper you. Through you, generations and generations will be blessed. And this land, he literally says last week, this land will be your land. And so Abraham throws church. He has a worship service. He's really excited. This land, awesome, awesome, awesome. He gathers converts. People are meeting God for the first time. And they get together. And then all of a sudden, the very next sentence is, now there was a famine in the land. I thought, God, you said you'd bless us. Now we can't eat. Just think about this for a moment. Just think about this. Abraham, the patriarch, God's going to bless you. And immediately, all right, first, first assignment, no food. What? No food. The land that God was going to bless them is not blessing them. Some of you, 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 you fully believe and know that God has spoken to you and, and has, has promised you something or given you a desire for something. You're like, when the heck is that going to happen? I was reading, I was watching something today of, of someone, of a church planter and a pastor who's, well, I don't even know how old he is. He's so great that he's old. Like, he's that old. Like, he's, he's like 60 plus. And he is just now getting a, a building. First time. His whole church planting career. Finally getting a building. They've been meeting in schools for, I don't know, 20-something years. I'm like, Gosh, is that what you mean, God? You're like, we got to wait? Like, what if, like, really? What if God doesn't fulfill his promise in, in, in 20 years for you? Like, later we're going to see that God doesn't fulfill the promise of even him having a son until he's 100. He's 75 right now. 25 years. Oftentimes when God calls us to something, we forget about his faithfulness. We years, like the, in the Bible, like 25 years is a long time. We can't wait like two minutes for things or like one week. We're like, for sure when I prayed about this, it should be happening tomorrow. I got more, I'm walking outside looking at the signs, looking at the, fl- the planes flying by, hoping it will say something in the clouds. Like, God, you got to speak to me. I'm waiting. A week goes by. Man, I guess he didn't speak. I guess he's not going to talk to me. I guess he's not showing up. So we do what Abraham does. So Abraham went down to Egypt. Like, we, we're so impatient that we, like Abraham, we go down to Egypt. And I want you to see this. The original audience, the first audience who, who this book was written to was, was Moses was the author. He had just rescued God's people out of Egyptian slavery, taking them through the, through the Red Sea uh, into the wilderness. And, and the Ten Commandments, that whole thing, God is now writing to, to them a history, a, a legacy of, of God's people. Where did it all begin? And God is writing to, 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 to Moses through Moses and to the people of Israel. And so when they would have heard this, when they would have saw this, that, that God had promised Abram this land, they've seen the land, they're there. They've seen it, it's real. They know that it's actualized, it's been there. They've been there, God has fulfilled his promise. So they already know that. And they're going, Abram, God promised you this. Now famine happens. They're like, we've heard this story before. Oh, and now he goes down to Egypt. They're probably going, no, bad, this is not good. This is not good. It's never good in the Bible when God's people go down to Egypt. It never is. It never is. What does he do? He goes to sojourn there. That means to live there. He goes to live in this land. Not the promised land. The land that he's not promised. He goes to live there. For the famine was severe. Before we start critiquing Abram so much, I want us to see this. This is us. Like we... Like, we, we can't wait on the Lord for, like, anything. Abram, like, at least it was, man, he was starving. We're like, man, God didn't show up. I mean, we don't know what it's like to starve. We really don't. Like, we're like, man, I'm famished, meaning 
you know, I haven't had my second breakfast. Like, I don't know. That's what we mean by that. Like, famine is not a normal thing that we understand. We typically don't. He can't eat. He can't provide. He's supposed to be this patriarch. And so instead of consulting God on what he should do and God's plans and God's purposes, he goes, you know what? I have a good idea. I have a good idea. Let's go down to Egypt. They seem to have food. Sounds good. Sounds great. Sounds good. a good idea. The only issue is we don't see him consulting God here. We see him later and at times consulting the Lord, but he doesn't consult God here. He just goes, you know what? I have a good idea. Let's go. And, and to be fair, like, he's hungry. I get it. He goes. And when he was about to enter Egypt, this is the, one of the weirdest texts of the entire Bible. I want you to know this. And I want you to, this is how we know the Bible is true. One of the ways we know the Bible is true. Because, like, you tell stories, you, te- you, tend, you, you do this. Whenever you, you tell a story, you tend to leave out the details you would never want anyone to know. Like, God mainly shows the details that you wouldn't ever want anyone to know. That's how you know it's true. This is how you know it's true. Here he goes. He's going down to the land, and then when he was about to enter Egypt, right before, you know, they're on the camels. Just picture this. They're, they're on the camels. They're, they're, they're riding in. And he said to, his, to Sarai, his wife, I know you are a beautiful woman in appearance. Ladies, if your husband ever starts this way in a conversation, just know, it's like, honey, you're so beautiful. Like your appearance, like there is none like you. Like, you're probably headed to Egypt. That's probably where you're going. And so he says, you're, you're a, I know you're a woman of beautiful appearance. He knows this. He's confident. He's also confident that he's hungry. And when you see the Egyptians, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, is this his wife? Or this is his wife. And then they will kill me. But they will let you live. So, say you are my sister. Like, ladies, if you're married, like, imagine this conversation. You're in the car. You're going into the next city. You're about to cross the, the checkpoint. You're, you're getting close to the border, uh, entering a new country. And it's like, all right, when we get here, you're my sister, all right? Sounds good? All right. If not, they're going to kill me. And she's like, I don't want him to die. He's a leader. He's the patriarch. I should trust. This is not a good plan. Not a good plan. We don't get to see her, her commentary on this, but apparently she goes along with it. So, say you're my sister, and it will go well with me because of you, that my, li- that my life may be spared for your sake. So they go into Egypt, there's a famine, they're going, and they get there. Uh, you have uh, Abram's wife, Sarai, apparently she's beautiful, apparently uh, the, the Egyptians, whether, we, we really don't know if this is true or not, but... It, Apparently, Abram thinks that if he goes there, that there's this thing that, you know, if sisters can be saved, but wives will kill you. Like, if you show up with your sister, you're good. We'll bless you. But if you show up with your wife, we'll take your head off. Apparently, that was a thing. We don't know why. We don't know. But that's the plan. And that's what he's, he's doing when he's, when he's heading into Egypt. So I want to ask you this question. What does, what, you're probably thinking, what was he thinking? Exactly. I don't know. What was he thinking? What drives your decision making? What, have you ever made a decision? Like, what was I thinking? Yeah, that's one of them. This is one of them. What was he thinking? And so what, what drives your decision-making process, process? Like, do you seek the Lord? We don't see him seek the Lord here. It's clearly the Lord is not in this situation because I guarantee God would say no to this plan. This is a bad plan. God's going to undo it here in a moment. But, but how do you make your decisions? I want us to see here that uh, Abram's scared. Literally scared of his life in two ways. Number one, the famine. Like, he can't provide. They can't eat. They're hungry. He, he's scared. He's scared for his life. But then also, for, for, for a legitimate reason or not, he seems to be scared of Egypt. He seems to be scared of heading down into Egypt, that if he, if he heads into Egypt, then his wife will be killed. Or, sorry, he will be killed. He doesn't care about her. He only cares about himself. That's really true. He really, he really only cares about himself here. Which is shocking. This is the patriarch. This is God's man. If God can use this fool, he can use you. Praise God for that. That's really good news. So he's not praying, he's not consulting the Lord, he's just driven by fear. And I want you to know this, decisions made in fear and anxiety hardly ever honor the Lord. The Bible repeatedly tells us to fear not. God has not given us a, a spirit of fear, if you're a Christian. A spirit of a sound mind, self-control. Like, this is not the ways of the Lord, to operate in this type of fear. What does God tell us to do? He tells us when we are fearful to cast our anxieties on him, to give them to him, 
It's not saying you can't be afraid. It's saying that when you're afraid, you run to the Lord. You process your fear and your pain and your, your struggle, your, your questions through God in prayer. It says that we're promising in Philippians that when we do that, his peace will rule your heart and mind. That's really good. What if Abraham, did he need this? He needs the Spirit of God to rule his heart and mind, right? I mean, what am I going to do about food? What am I going to do about my life? Ever been there? Let's keep going. Chapter 12, verses 14 through 16. Now when Abram entered Egypt, so he fulfills, he's going to walk through with this plan. No, he's really, really passionate about this plan. The Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. So, hey, Pharaoh, this lady just walked in. She came through the checkpoint. Security's checked her out. Good looking. What do you want us to do with her? And the woman was then taken to Pharaoh's house. All right, let's take her. This is not uncommon. We even see this with, with David. When he looks out, Bathsheba's taking a bath. Guys, don't ever look out at another man's wife taking a bath. It never ends well. It doesn't end well for, uh, for, for her husband or for David. Not a good thing. But sometimes God's men act like fools, oftentimes, actually. And so he looks out. He says, you know what? I want her. Bring her in. Sounds good. Let's bring her in. In verse 16, for her sake, then, he dealt well with Abram. All right, that's your sister. Good looking. Awesome. Great job. You know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. He says, he gives him uh, sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. Like, all right. Thanks for your sister. This is kind of like a dowry in, in some way. Like, Because later we're going to find out that Pharaoh takes Sarai for his wife. Let's not miss what just happened. Abram, the patriarch in whom the blessing, the seed uh, through his descendants will become Jesus. Like eventually Jesus is coming from his lineage. Like he and Sarai, not Sarai and some other dude, not, a, not Egyptian Pharaoh. This is what's going on. Abraham in, in the flesh, if we're just looking at it from the flesh, Abraham's literally jeopardizing the plan. What if she gets pregnant by this guy, the Pharaoh? It's like that where the seed's coming from? We're going to find out later that they, they, they tend to be really unclear that when God says Sarai and Abram, that's who the descendant's going to come from. They really mix this up a lot. This is the first time they do it. He sends her in. But I want you to see, and I, don't, and I wonder if Abram here is, is just gone. you know what, God, maybe some of you are like this. God, you've promised me some things in your word. Like you legitimately promised me some things in your word that you haven't come to pass on. Like, I'm in the famine world. Like, I'm, I'm just sitting here famished. Like, you haven't showed up. I prayed and prayed and prayed for provision or for answers. And you're not talking to me. Like, you're not showing up year after year after year. You're like, what do I do, God? What do I do? Maybe he's frustrated, and he's like, you know what? I don't really care about the promise. God, you've left me alone here. You ever been that way? God, I just feel alone. I'm frustrated. I don't care about your plan. Forget it. I'm going to screw it up. I don't care. I'm going to protect myself. Like, the patriarch Abraham is like you. Undermining God, God's will and ways. Maybe God hasn't fulfilled his end of the deal in your life yet. And you're like, man, you know what? I don't know if I want to keep following him. I've only received pain when I met Jesus. Some people think that when you meet Jesus, then all of a sudden life gets better. For Abram, when he meets God, it gets worse. <laughs> Famine. It's the first thing. Sometimes it gets a little better. We all are going to go through the famine series of our life. Where God feels distant and silent. What God is trying to do in those times is remind us of who he is. And so he allows us to act a fool like he's, gonna, he's allowed Abram. So he can show us his mercy and grace. And through that, grow us. He does the same thing with his disciples in the New Testament. And he does the same thing with us. Abraham's in the process of learning who God is. I want you to see that. Some, some of you think that you have to meet Jesus and know everything. Like you, some of you think that you have to already arrive at places. Some of you treat others like they should already be more mature than they are. 
God has promised Abram he will do this work. The day he meets God. He hasn't gone to seminary. He hasn't read a Bible. He doesn't know anything yet. Like, all right, I know how to spell your name. That's about it. That's all I got. You sound really forceful and like you're in control. Like, I'm going to obey you. All right. He doesn't, he, this is like the first season of, of testing of Abram's faith. He's just believed. He's made converts. He's worshipped. He's on his mission. He's like, yes, yes, yes. And now famine enters the land. And so he's like, you know what? i got to figure this out. i got to provide. Let's go down to Egypt. And what he, in doing so, he's put his, his wife at, je, at jeopardy. She's vulnerable. She's literally taken as a, another wife for another man. Guys, this is not okay. Not good. He does what a man named Adam also does. He doesn't protect his wife. And what we see here in generations after generations, men will be prone to putting their wife as the airbag for deployment when they're about to hit in the wreck. And that's what he does. It's about to go bad. Let's throw my wife out there and protect myself. Adam blames Eve. So he puts her in a weird, weird position. And then the plan backfires. Hey, I don't think Abram was thinking, here's the goal. I'm going to give you away as another man's wife. I don't think that was the, I don't think any husband in the history has ever thought, here's the plan. I'm going to give my wife to another man to be his wife. That's not, that wasn't the plan. It was just, I'm going to tell him he's my, she's my sister so I don't get killed. And we're just going to lie. His lie has now turned into his wife has been taken from him. Abram's wife is now Pharaoh's wife. And what happens though here? This is amazing. This is not if you don't believe in the mercy and grace of God to even overcome sin and folly and foolishness, then you'll disbelieve this. Like, this is amazing. It's literally shocking. He gives his wife away, trades his wife, Abram, and he gets wealthy. God gets, he gets blessed. He gets sheep, ox. He, he, gets, he gets stuff. He gets provision. He escapes the famine. Like, I don't know if he's thinking, boom, my plan worked. Ha-ha. I don't know what he's thinking. But I want you to know that God's grace will abound to you if God has promised things to you, no matter if you're, you're in obedience or not. Sometimes. In this case is what I'm, I'm saying is that God provided and said he's going to make him rich and wealthy. But he didn't say how he was going to do it. And this is the, one of the ways in which he does this. I want you to see this, that just because something is fruitful or prosperous doesn't mean it's righteous and godly. That's what I'm trying to see. I want you to see. But what we must see here is that Abram is a fool, but God is full of grace. That like God is still fulfilling his promise through Abram. He's blessing him even when he's a fool. Some of you have looked around and you go, man, that guy or that girl, like they're really acting like a fool. They're not really following Jesus. And I just don't understand why like things tend to work out for them and not for me. Because we do this comparison thing in the United States. Like we, which we expect that God needs to treat you in the same way he treats me. But really God's working on a different thing in them and working on a different thing in your heart. You got to understand that. But we don't. So we, we compare, we contrast, we, we get bitter, we get angry, we get mad, we get jealous. And through that, to all the jealous, all of the sin-filled men and women that God has called to himself, he's still abounding in grace, even in our foolishness. And so the thing I want us to see here is that God is faithful even when we are foolish and faithless. Verse 17. But, when, but, but the Lord, God, Yahweh, afflicted Pharaoh. God's like, I'm not letting you give your wife away, Abram. That was a dumb plan. I need to fix it. My kids do a lot of dumb plans. As a father, I have to fix a lot of things. We must see that we are God's kids. We act like a fool. We're like three-year-olds more than we are adults. And his house, so the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. If you remember, original audience, listening in on this, they just came out of Egyptian slavery. They just got rescued out of there. How God sent plagues to, to torment the Egyptians. They're going... Dude, he did this before. Whoa, we know about this. We know about this. Like, God did this back then? Oh, man, this is kind of cool. I mean, you got to be thinking if you're, if you're like the original audience going, man, plagues. 
These are not cool. Egypt got them twice? Wow. God must really want us to be rescued from them and not be enslaved to them. Indeed, he does. Great plagues came because of Sarai and Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What the heck, dude? Why did you tell me this was your sister? What have you done to me, he said. Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say this is, she is my sister so that I have took her for my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. I imagine this conversation wasn't going over well. Like the ruler of the land, you've been sojourning, you've been living. There's still a famine. And so he comes out, man, I blessed you. The Lord afflicted me. Just see this. Pharaoh blesses Abram, and then he gets afflicted because of Abram. This is crazy. Just thinking about the complexity here. The point is, is that God is the protector. God is the faithful God. Even when we, all humans, are foolish and and faithless. Even when we are foolish and faithless, God is faithful. We must see this. This is a divine intervention. No one can thwart God's plan. Abram can't, Sarah can't, Pharaoh can't, nobody can. I want you to know this. In this day and age, no ruler, no principality, no spiritual realm of darkness, nothing in all creation can, can thwart God's plan. For you, for his church, nothing. You're like, it just looks like a lot of darkness and a lot of, we're like, we probably live in a world that's more like Abram in here. We're just looking at things, I don't know how it's going to play out. I just don't know how it's going to play out. I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm looking at, I just, it just doesn't look well. And Abram's learning for the first time that even when we are foolish and sinful, God's grace abounds. Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. And that's true to even this day. Does that mean, though, that we should be foolish on purpose so that God's grace abounds? Like, absolutely not. Paul says this to the Romans. Like, should we sin so grace may abound? No. Will it abound even in your sinfulness and folly? Absolutely. So God blesses Abram on their way out. He sends them out. They leave the land. They send them away. And so we get to verse 1 of chapter 13. God has blessed Abram, and there's going to be strife now. So Abram went up from Egypt, and he and his wife and all he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. So he got rich through this. Like God blessed him through this. And also Lot, they, they've been really blessed through this. I want you to see this is not, this is not any, bless, any material blessing, any spiritual blessing, any intellectual blessing, any financial blessing, any blessing you have, no matter how you got it, is from the Lord. Even theft... Like, you can't, like, I'm not saying you should, and absolutely not. What I'm saying is that there's nothing that happens except through God and by his will. Like, you can be fooled, like, God can still punish you, but all the money is God's money. No one owns anything. You don't own anything. The Egyptians don't own anything. America doesn't own anything. That has not been handed over for us to borrow until Jesus returns. Everything we have is on loan from the God who made everything. It's on loan. And so God has chosen to to bless Abram through this, even through his sinfulness and folly. And so they get out, and they go back to the place between Bethel and Ai. This is where they were in the beginning, when when he built an altar, had church, To the place where he had made the altar first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. God has rescued him. What does he do? This is what our life should look like. We sin. We are foolish. We we fall. uh, We rebel against God. God shows up. Has mercy and grace upon us. Blesses us. Forgives us. Washes us clean. And what do we, what our response should be? All right. Worship. We don't see him wallowing in self-pity. We don't see him. He goes back to worship. All right, God, you saved me. I learned something that you are faithful even when I'm not. You, I, I'm learning something, so I'm going to go back to worship. I'm going to call upon your name. And we see this theme. God saves mankind, acts like a fool and sins. God shows up and saves again. Mankind repents and, and worships God. That's our life. That's your life. 
you worship God, you fall, and when you sin, and you repent and worship Him again. You just keep doing that every day for the rest of your life until Jesus comes back home, and then there'll be no sin, no shame, no suffering, no more, and all you will do is worship. So if you don't like worshiping God here, like, you're not going to like heaven. Like, hopefully, you're, I mean, your sin will be removed if you're a Christian, and there will be uh, no more sin, so you'll fully love it. But, I mean, we should love worship. Everything we do is worship. We should love it. So Lot's with him, and Lot had, in verse 5, Lot, who went with, him, with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents, and so that the land could not support them dwelling together. They're so, they have so much stuff. You ever been on vacation somewhere when you go see your, your in-laws or parents or something, and you go back and you come back with more stuff than you have room in the car? That's what happened. That's what they happened. They went down to Egypt. They come back with more stuff. It's amazing how that happens. In the land, but the land could not even support it. So, for the possessions that they had were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At the time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites lived in the land. God has prospered Abram. He has prospered Lot. And there's not enough room in this land for both of them. Imagine that. That's how much time has passed. That's how much God has been blessing. Oftentimes you read this and you go, okay, um, Abram got a call from God, then immediately there was a famine. He went to Egypt, and then three days later he got back on the journey. No, like he, he was in Egypt so long that he, they, Abram and Lot accumulated so much wealth, and in his, in his herds were able to reproduce so much. They have so much now when exiting then, then, that there's no more land for them. And God has been faithful to bless them here. And I want you to see here that God's people can enjoy prosperity. There's, a, there's oftentimes we, it's, it's maybe less now than, oh, well maybe not, where, where Christians adopt this poverty mentality where they think wealth is evil, like money is evil. Money's not evil. The love of money is evil, but not money. Money's just paper. It's just, it's a gift that God has given you to steward. And so wealth is not a sin. The question, the sin lies in your heart. Sin lies in your heart. God has called his people to, to steward wealth, to be a blessing, and that's why he's given Abram this blessing of wealth and land, to be a blessing to others. And I want you to see this, that God's blessing doesn't always make life easier. In this case, it's making life harder. God's blessed them. Right now in our kids' ministry, is God's blessed it. Multiplying kids from within and from outside, like, it's growing, but every week, some of you ladies or, and guys who have served back there are like, man, it seems like I used to serve once a month. Now I'm serving like every two weeks. Yeah, because God's multiplying it. You're like, I'm feeling strife with my schedule. Like, I'm frustrated. Why are they always asking me to serve? Like I have to serve on this team and that team. And like, when am I going to get a break? Well, tell God not to provide. Like that's the only other option. That's what he's, like, what are you going to do? Like, this is us. This is us, right? Like, oh, God is growing it, and I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. Like, this is Abram and his, and his, and his staff, right? He, they, they're the livestock and lots, the herdsmen and lots herdsmen, they're, like, fighting. Like, man, you're taking my volunteers. Or, no, you're taking my sheep. You're doing the, oh, I'm tired. I'm, I'm exhausted. Fight, 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 fight. This always happens. When God shows up, and blessed strife will happen. We see this in the New Testament when the church grows. They go, one sermon, they go, thousands get saved. Imagine that. Your community group leader, and like one, one day, you just really get deep in prayer and you walk out in, in your house and you, you say, Today, we're gonna go share the gospel. And people actually do it. Amazing miracle number one. Don't, don't, don't be, why are, you, why are you so offended by that? Like, just, just imagine. What if you did it? You go out and thousands of people come back, changed. And you have no room in your house anymore. Like, you're frustrated because now you can't host, everything's dirty. Man, we don't have... That's what life is like following God. And I think it's real funny because if we really believed in the call that God had on for us, like, our lives would look more like that. Messy. It just feels like we can't ever figure it out. It feels like we're always flying by the seats of our pants. That's what happens when God blows the wind of blessing upon his people. You can't keep up with it. You can't keep up with it. And so, as needs increase and prosperity increase, or as prosperity increases, so needs do too. You see it in conversions, in homes, in, in, in properties and facilities, or in volunteers, or structures. When God blesses, 
He's, what he's also doing is testing and trying and forging the hearts of people. We've got to see that. God cares more about your soul than your productivity. So God will bless you with production so that he can stir up all the mess in your own heart. It's like a coffee cup. You ever been, had a coffee cup and someone, it happened to me today. I won't tell you who. Bumped me, coffee f- spilled out. Was the problem that I got bumped or was the problem that there was coffee in my cup? Problem is that there was coffee in my cup. Problem is not that I got bumped. If there's nothing in your cup, nothing will come out. Our hearts are full of sin and God likes to bump our cups. And coffee's always flowing out of my cup. I don't know about yours, but always. Because there's sin in my heart. But here, where Abram, what we're going to see here is a compare and contrast. When he was going into Egypt, he was not living by faith, but by fear. But now what we see here is that Abram's going to step out in faith, faith in God, and it's going to drive generosity. Verse 8, when Abram said, to, then Abram said to Lot, so there's strife. Let there not be, let there be no strife between you and me. So he cares about his relationships. He cares about the relationship here. And, he's, and he cares about the relationship of, of his staff and Lot's staff. His people, all these groups of people. He cares about them. He says, let there not be any strife between uh, you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. I want you to know this, church. If you know, love, and trust Jesus, you are kinsmen. You are kinsmen. We've been, our big brother is Jesus and God is our father. We are, we are literally blood-bought in relationship. And there's strife sometimes. In verse 9, is not this whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, I will go to the right. If you take the right, I'll go to the left. What Abram is doing, and the commentators and scholars would say, is what he's, he's opening his hands. He's being very generous. He's saying, Lot, you get the best pick. You get the pick, whatever you want. I love you so much. I, I, I love our relationship. And also, I trust God. I'm tired of not trusting God. Any of you, like, tired of not trusting God? Like, when you live your life not trusting God, trying to control everything, trying to manipulate everything, trying to make everything work, it's exhausting. Like, Abram just went through this. I didn't trust God. There's a famine, so I'm going to sell my, like, give my wife away. I mean, I'm just, I bet they're still in counseling to this day because of that. Like, if they were walking around on earth, they would, their whole life were probably in counseling from this, move, from this moment in their marriage. It was awful. Like, just imagine. I can't. I'm not, um, and so God has given Abraham grace, and he now has faith again. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to fight over this land. I'm not going to fight over God's promises. Clearly, if I can be so foolish to go down to Egypt, give up my wife, like, and God can fix that, he can fix anything. And now I just want that for you. I want that for all of us, to just trust God so much that we just, like, let go. Or stop trying to grab a hold of everything. We all have some cause that we are like, Argh. You know, God cares about your cause more than you do. He does. He's perfect in it. Like, how, what is it that you're trying to force? What is it that you don't want to let your grip off of? Maybe if you would relinquish your hands, you would see that not only do you get a peace and power, but God will continue to provide. So Abram, filled with faith, offers Lot his pick of the land because he knows God is going to be faithful. And I want you to see this. When people, when God's people are filled with faith, faith-filled people are generous. It's a natural response. Faith-filled people are generous. You're not faith in yourself when you have faith in God. We're generous with our money. We're generous with our time. We're, we're generous with our grace towards one another. Abram was just faithless, and now he's walking in faith. And we see it clearly by his actions. His heart changed, and therefore his actions changed. So my question for you is, will you walk by faith, or will you walk by sight? Abram is walking by faith. Here, Lot will walk by sight. We see it here in verse 10. It says, and Lot lifted up his eyes. Literally, walking by sight. Lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord. This is a reference back to like the garden of Eden. This is it. This is my utopia. This is great. It's like the Garden of Eden. This is awesome. Like Egypt, which was godless, just so you know. Like if you compare things to like, you know, that's like that area. It's just really wicked and evil. 
Doesn't, they don't care how much water there is there. It's not a good land. In the direction of Zoar, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Fun fact, as you're reading this, is not a good land. That's why they wrote it in there. It's going to get destroyed because of wickedness. So Lot chose for himself of all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other. And Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while uh, Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, the, and the, the author wants us to know this. He's like, okay, sounds cool. He, he picked, made a decision. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and great sinners against the Lord. The reason why he, the author puts this in this is because you want, what, what Lot is doing is he's looking around and he's looking at all the, the outward appearances of things. He's not looking at the heart of the people or his own heart in his decision-making process. All he's looking at is the sight. What are the opportunities? He's opportunistic. He's excited. He, he sees the opportunities. But what he doesn't do is see his own soul. He doesn't see his own soul maybe going after opportunities and maybe being parched. And, and while it's, it's well, there's a lot of water there and he's gonna, his mouth is going to get uh, filled with water and he will not and he'll be able to you know he'll never thirst again physically his internally he doesn't see that this place might be a wasteland for his soul later we're going to see in a few chapters that that he doesn't just settle in this land he moves all the way into Sodom like that's where he's going to live he's going to live among what we see here he's going to choose willingly to go into Sodom uh, to live in partake in the wickedness and sinfulness of Sodom that's where he's going and, and we see this here, and, and, and Moses wants us to, to see this, is that this language that we see oftentimes in Genesis is they saw and they took. They saw and they took. Whenever you see that in Genesis, it's probably bad. They saw and they took. Eve saw and she took. Lot sees and he took. He lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley, Valley was water, and that's the land he took. And what, what the, the focus here is that he's looking with, at the external and not looking internally and asking God for direction. Again, he's not asking God which way would be best. Because the, the issue is not the land. The issue is his heart. Why does he want this land? And some, some of you, like when in your decision-making process, you might find that there's a house or an opportunity when God may be calling you or giving you a job opportunity somewhere. But it's going to uh, be really painful for your wife and kids, perhaps. Maybe, maybe that's not the area you should go live in. Like if you're going to, man, well, we're going to have a lot of money, we're going to have a lot of time, we're going to have a lot of stuff, but like it's going to literally destroy your wife and kids. I want you to know that probably should be weighed into the equation. Maybe say no to that. For example, there, there, there's literally places that, that have, that because of the weather and climate, there's certain people that have certain health conditions that it's not good for them. The, the dollar might be right, but the, but the place may not be. That's what's going on here. There's great opportunities here for, for Lot. But it's not good opportunity for his soul. And so when it comes to our decision-making process, are we led in faith in the promises of God? Or are we just simply looking at outward appearances? I'm not saying we can't look at good opportunities. I'm not saying that we do. But as we look at good opportunities, we've got to ask ourselves, how is this holistically going to help me glorify the Lord? I imagine if Lot was doing that, he wouldn't have moved into Sodom. He's like, I'm going to move over here. See, Abram goes into wicked places. But he does it to make converts. Lot goes into wicked places to become converted. And some of you have wrongly thought that you're a missionary because God said you are. You are, but you don't live as one. So you go into the, 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 the lion's den, so to speak, or you go into the land of, of, of Sodom like Lot, and then you just get swept up by the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah, the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of the age, and like that's got your grip. Like you think you're being missional and living, but really your soul is, is gripped by wickedness and evil. You didn't go in faith. You went with sight. That's how you know where you're at. Where are you at? Is your soul encouraged in the Lord, in the land that you've put your tent in, and the place that you've snuggled up next to, the friends you hang around with, how you run and rule your life? Is it honoring the Lord, or is it like Lot? Moving away from the Lord. On the surface, we go like, well, can I not have these friends? Can I not live? No, no. I'm saying, yes, you can. I'm asking about your heart. Sometimes you'll get so far down the road that you'll realize you made your decisions by sight and not by faith. You were, you were captivated by something in the culture. You were captivated from your sight. And it's led away your soul. But even then, even then, 
God remains faithful to his promises. So if you're a child of God, he will rescue you and redeem you out of that. But may today, if you realize that, may you turn back to the Lord. May you turn back to the Lord. Verse 14, God remains faithful to his promises, specifically here to Abram. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had departed from him, lift up your eyes. So God's doing the eye thing too. Look around. So don't hear me say you can't look at good opportunities. What I'm saying here, what's going on in your heart? Lift up your eyes and look to the place from where you are. Northward, southward, eastward, westward, all of it. Look around. Everything you can see, Abram. For all the land that you see, I will give, you and give to you and your offspring forever. And I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth. Meaning there will be so many you can't count. So that if one could count the dust of the earth, so your, your offspring would also be able to be counted. Verse 17. Arise and walk. Through the length, the breadth of the land. Walk all over it. Go see it all. I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which was at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. God is remaining faithful to his promise. This is what we need to see here. Abram was trusting God with the outcome. And indeed he was right. God was going to fulfill his promises. God shows up. Lot got that land. It didn't matter the land. God was the faithful God. Abram decided to keep his hands open. God, wherever you want to take me, wherever you want to lead me, wherever you want to go, that's where we're going to go. This has been our journey. And this is, this is what we've tried to do, especially coming out of COVID. God, where do you want us? We want to be open. We're meeting at 4 p.m. It's not the most ideal service. But God is faithful. God is faithful. People are meeting Jesus. We're we're baptizing folks. God is at work in our midst. It's our job to just remain faithful and hands open. God, where do you want us? Because we know that he is faithful to build his church. And so God's promises remain faithful here. And Abram is trusting God with the outcome. And I want us to see this. This is how we're going to end. I want this to be us. I don't want us to be so fear-ridden and angry, anger-ridden. That we are so anxious that we're not freed like Abram. We are, many of us are right now are like Abram in the beginning. we just got a tight grip on our life. There's famine, I'm scared, there's fear, there's things. I'm gonna just want to control everything, control all the outcomes. I want us to move to Abram at the end of our time today. Where he's faithful. He, he, he trusts in the faithfulness of God. We live in a world that's outraged. This week, was like many other weeks in our world. And for some of us, like we're, we're frustrated more than ever. We're fearful more than ever. We're, we're, we're worried in some ways, in different ways than we have been. And I want you to see that I really, the Bible is very clear that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The battle we're in is a spiritual battle that's going after our souls. So the media and other humans are either being agents of the Lord Jesus or they're being agents of Satan demons. Those are the only two ways. This isn't, I'm not knocking anything. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying that's just how the world works. You're either being led by the Holy Spirit or you're being led by Satan and demons. That's bottom line. How do you know that you're being led by the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible tells us. There's fruit that overflows from the Holy Spirit. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. The opposite of that is the way of the world and the way of Satan and demons. Look around the world we live in. Look at the media, look at the news, look at the propaganda that's everywhere. Is it creating in your soul love, joy, peace, patience? Are you growing in kindness and gentleness and self-control? If you're not, you're being led by the spirit of the age, Satan and demons. Like, well, can I not look at news and media? No, absolutely you can. Follow the spirit through it, not Satan and demons. The spirit doesn't produce outrage. The spirit doesn't produce hate, unless it's against the sin in your own soul. Genuine love does hate evil, but doesn't hate people. Lot is walking into an area in a day and a time that is not filled with fruit of the Spirit. Anger, rage, outrage, 
sexual deviance. It's going to get really, really weird. And, I, and, and as your pastor, I, I want to, something I've been thinking about this week is that I don't know that many of you have the spiritual maturity to handle social media or the news. I love you, and that's why I say it. I don't, right or left, both, I'm uh, both. Like, I don't give the keys to my car to my son, who's seven years old, and I say, you know, drive it. I think we're going to look back in the age of media and social media and all the stuff, and we're going to go, man, they were really good tools, but we handed them to kids too young. Like, we, we didn't give, we, we, no, not discerning, we just handed these things out. Like, we, do, we realize that with alcohol, we really realize that with cigarettes, we realize that with, with vehicles, we realize that with weapons. We, like, it, we, we've now handed out this thing that looks and, and feels like normal, and, and some people are like, man, that's all I've ever known. But you're never taught how to handle it. You're never taught how to live by the Spirit of God while engaging culture. You are thrown into a culture without the tools to navigate it. And many of you become Christians, and now you're like, I'm trapped. And I feel like the church isn't talking about these things, and when they do, I fight them, and it's just the world is answering these things. And it's just, we're just struggling. And so I'm reminding us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But what does the news tell us? What do our social media tell us? That it's actually there's good guys and there's bad guys, and we got to fight each other. Whether it be political good guys and bad guys. But we're talking about humans. There's actual humans that we're fighting against. But the Bible says, no, you don't. It's principalities, spiritual realm of darkness that you're fighting against. You've been deceived. You're addicted. You're not self-controlled. You're engaging unknowingly in a war for your soul with no weapons. You're like Lot who foolishly, unknowingly, maybe even out of a, the goodness of his heart, he wasn't trying to be wicked. Maybe he was. I don't know. We don't know here. We do know that he wanted to go there, so he went there, but he didn't have rain over his soul. And he gets devoured in Sodom and Gomorrah. And I would say this, that the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah is alive and well in our world. Can we engage it as Christians with the gospel? Absolutely. Can we engage it with maturity? Absolutely. Can we engage it in a way that redeems it? Absolutely. But I, I just would ask you this. If you, as you're engaging in the world we live in, the conversations you're having in the media, social media, all these things, in your heart, and you're not able to exercise the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control, and not lash out in hatred and harm towards other people, then maybe you should lay down your weapon of social media and sit silent and let those who are trained go to war. You're like, who is the trained? I don't know. God will call him. I'm not saying I am. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm equipped to do it. I'm saying I'm a part of it. Like, I, I get it. What I'm saying is that if you take the faith of Abraham, you'll go, okay, God, if I, if I let go of this, I trust that you're still going to do justice. I trust that you're still going to do mercy. Like right now, I can't operate in this world living by the fruit of the Spirit. I don't have joy. I'm not loving. I don't have peace. I'm anxious. But anxiety is the, it's like the highest recorded increase of, of emotional well-being in our country in 2020. Anxiety is up. Proof that we're not walking by the Spirit. I'm not shaming you. What I'm saying is that maybe for a season, we should detox from Sodom and Gomorrah and realign our hearts and souls. And like Abram, at the end, he builds an altar and worships the Lord. And some of you will reject and go, well, well we've got to be missionaries, Al. Like church planting, you just talked about that. How are we going to engage culture? How are we going to be missional? How are we going to do all these things? I'm like, no, I agree, we are. But can we be like Abram and go, you know what? My hands are open. If I'm not the social media influencer, God will find another one. Right? I'm not saying that there are not issues we need to be involved in. I'm saying that many of us are not spiritually mature to handle the information we're given. And I want you to know that the, you were not created to handle all this information. You were not. 
Human beings were not meant to live in 24-hour news cycles and then consume information, get outraged, die down and get new information, get outraged. Like, you see this. So can we, like Abram, move from where we have a grip on everything to letting go and trusting? Because I promise you this, promise you this, that God is faithful. He is faithful. God's promise to Abram has already come true. The promised seed was the Lord Jesus. And he's come. He's died in our place for our sins. And he's risen victorious, defeating Satan, sin, death, the grave. I want you to see this. God is faithful to the promise of Abraham. He has been faithful. Jesus has come. And it's through Jesus that we're told that the nations shall then be blessed. I know we're, we're going longer than normal. But I don't want us to miss this. That if, if God is faithful when Abram is an idiot gives his wife up. He's going to give his wife up again later. He's also going to sleep with another woman. He's going to keep messing up. If God is faithful with him, why would he not be faithful with you? You see, at the cross of the Lord Jesus, God's mercy and God's justice collide. You know who cares more about mercy and justice than you? Jesus. So much so that he died for it. He died for it. At the cross, God pours out his judgment against sin and sinners. All of it. All of it. All of his judgment towards sin and sinners on Jesus Christ. All of it. So you think about the person you hate. Or the, think about the group of people you're really, really, really angry at. I want you to know. And, and, and what if I told you that if they trust Jesus, all their sins would be forgiven? Would you still be angry at them? Would you still hate them? If so, I invite you to receive the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus yourself. I started off by reminding you of a guy named Paul who was a Christian killer. God changed him. We don't believe that God can change people, so we want to destroy them. But if you thought that God could change them, you would have grace towards them, just like he had grace towards you. And if that, on the cross, God's mercy and grace collide, what that means is you, who are a Christian, have been given his spirit, to continue to be a minister of that mercy and that grace. And let everyone know that justice has been served, that sin has been dealt with. Through faith in Jesus, you can be made new. And from that point, an individual's heart will change upon believing that message. And they will begin living out biblical justice and mercy. That's how it happens. And if you're like looking around going, biblical justice and mercy is not being lived out. You want to know why? Because no one's a Christian. Wake up. Wake up. I hear so many people talking about justice, change, and mercy in, in the world. I hear no one talking about Jesus. Well, but Jesus would act this way. Yes, he would. You can't have someone act like Jesus if they don't have the Spirit of God in them. I promise you, if you'd be faithful to preach the gospel, the good news that our God alone saves sinners and herald the truth to your friends, that they are sinners and that they need a Savior, the Lord Jesus. And if they don't turn and repent of their sins, then they will be forever uh, separated from the love of God, the God who has mercy, the God who is just, the God who cares. If you don't plead with them for salvation, stop pleading with anyone for change. Because you have the only thing that can change the world. Like, I don't see anyone lining up, protest, like screaming this. But in the New Testament, the apostles, they go out. And they stand up. And they boldly proclaim and tell people. Sinner, 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 Jesus, Savior, let's all look there. What happens? They get silenced. They heal people and proclaim Jesus. They go to prison. And they say, you know what? You can do all these good works, but don't talk about Jesus. If you do, we'll kill you. 
What do they do? So, all right, we'll scrap the good works. We're just going to go straight to Jesus. Harold Jesus. From that message, the entire world was changed. Yes, good works happened in the wake of that. But good works flow from good news. And I really plead with us. I do believe the world is messed up. I do believe there's a lot of things that we need to change. I do believe that it, it, it need, the world needs spirit-filled men and women to go out and engage culture and exercise mercy and justice according to the Bible. But I want you to know this. Looking someone in the eye, telling them that they're a sinner and that God is, the Lord Jesus is their Savior, if it worked in Acts, it can work now. The problem is, you don't believe that. So you don't say that. And so, I don't know where you are personally at right now. Some of you are angry. Some of you are convicted. Some of you don't know what the next steps look like. Well, as you wait on the Lord, it may be years like Abram for God to fulfill his promise, for, to, to bring about reconciliation or to change your heart or, or, to, or to move you where he wants you. In the meantime, what I want us to do is what we see at the end. We'll come back to the Lord and worship. Come back to the Lord and worship. And we're going to do that through the taking of communion. We'll do that through the singing of song. And some of you, the Lord has pressed upon your heart something that you need to agree with him on before you go to the table. Some of you are angry and your heart is hardened. So don't go to the table. I want you to know this. If you, Christian, are going to the table with the spirit of anger in you, I'm asking that you stop. Repent of that anger. Give it to the Lord Jesus. Let the Spirit of God be reminded of that forgiveness and then go to the table. The Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, when they didn't do that, people died. To prove. God killed people who were taking communion with a wicked heart. To show the church. To remind God's people of what they were doing. So I want you to confess your sin to the Lord. Confess your anger. Confess your guilt. Confess your frustration. Confess your, your, your folly, your foolishness, your rebellion. Confess that you are not self-controlled. Confess your anger. Give it to the Lord Jesus. And then re be remind, remind yourself that there's more mercy and grace in the Lord Jesus than sin in you. That all of your sins have been washed away. And from a heart that wells up with worship and thanks to the Lord Jesus for his salvation, then go to the table and partake. Lord Jesus, we love you. If it wasn't for you rescuing us and our foolishness and our faithlessness and our sin and our rebellion, we would not be here today. Lord, we look at the world we live in like Abram did in the land that he was in and he sees famine. He's frustrated. He's been waiting on you. So he decides to take matters into his own hands and go down to Egypt. Lord Jesus, we have taken matters into our own hands and, and we're trying to work out many things with good hearts oftentimes. But we, we, we want, we're not men and women who stay content and waiting on you. And so we, in frustration and rebellion, we go down to Egypt ourselves. And we're anxious and we're angry and we're proud and we, we just are so frustrated when we look around the world, a lot like Abraham was. We don't know what to do, Lord. And so we've, we've journeyed into Egypt. Lord, may we see that you're faithful always and forever. And may that, your faithfulness, you promising that you're going to fix this world that we live in. You've promised it. May we agree with you. May we get healthy enough to engage culture in a way that's glorifying to you. Many of us are ridden with anxiety, fear, anger, hatred, frustration. And we're not filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And Lord, help us. We need self-control. We don't look at people as if they're image bearers. But we, we count up their sins of the past and we 
condemn them in the flesh. Oh Lord, may we see that Jesus hung on the cross. In our place, he hung in their place. We need not kill. We need not hate. Lord, may your grace cover us and forgive us of our sin. May this, a spirit of repentance be among your people, like it was with Abram. And his response was, I trust you, God. You will see to it to fulfill your promises. And what looked like Abram was being passive in this moment, we know later he will be active. But oftentimes, Lord Jesus, we forget that us waiting on you to be filled with your spirit, to be healthy, to be set apart, to be equipped is the necessary path for you sending us out into the battlefield. Lord, we are a people who are impatient and we don't know what training looks like. We don't know what waiting looks like. While we figure that out, Lord, I ask that you'd be gracious to us to show us that your steadfast love is greater than life. Your mercies are new every day. May we fall in love with you, Jesus, today as we remember that our sins are much, but Lord Jesus, your mercy is more. It's in your name I pray, amen.